Hey everyone. Um, now we're at chapter three, and by this time you ought to be getting pretty settled into sort of how these lectures run. Um, I try to keep them to about 30 minutes at most. I've been breaking them up into anywhere from 12 to 15 minute segments so you can sort of, you know, stop and catch your breath and things like that. But um, I'm just experimenting, so I'd like your feedback, whether you'd like to have it in either one long uh, clip or whether you like the split up of the 12 to 15 minute variations. Um, they won't all be this long. It depends on the chapter. Uh, but some of these chapters are, you know, I would think are, are just really important. So if I have to take a little more time, I will. Um, and it's hopefully to help you sort of understand where we are. So I don't walk through them uh, PowerPoint by PowerPoint. I will just discuss the things that I think are really relevant and important from my end. Um, so with that, you know, chapter three for me is arguably the most important chapter in the entire book. Uh, not just because of what's currently going on in our country with all the protests and things that I that uh, really are, I think, fascinating regarding the issue of civil rights and civil liberties, uh, but also in the context of us understanding how important it is that we learn to respect each other, uh, whether it be by ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, uh, just, you know, whether we have physical issues or whatever those things are that we learn to respect one another and why it's important that we learn to work together and uh, not separate ourselves. Um, you know, there's an old adage called divide and conquer. And um, frequently we find today that the easiest way to break people up is to divide and conquer them. Uh, it's interesting, there was a, uh, a video that was shot in the 1960s where a teacher uh, took a classroom, I think they were third graders, and uh, they're predominantly all white kids. And what they, in order to illustrate the issue of what happens when you break people apart and across certain things, she took the brown eyed kids over here, the blue eyed kids over here, and then she started treating one group better than the other group. And it was amazing to see the reactions of how the other kids that were treated poorly uh, were treated. Um, very fascinating uh, video. If I can find it, I might pop, pop it up on, the, on our video list. But it was very fascinating because what it says is, is when you start treating certain groups a certain way, they will respond or react uh, accordingly uh, to the way they're treated. Um, but nonetheless, in this chapter, there's a lot of videos that I really that are part of this chapter, and I want you to watch as many of them as possible. Uh, particularly the one Dr. Henry Louis Gates on blacks and and, and in Latin America, particularly in Mexico. I think you'll find it to be very interesting. Um, it's funny, when I was growing up, uh, and I'm usually, I find me to be very direct and controversial. I don't mind confronting stuff directly. And sometimes if that makes us get uncomfortable, I'm perfectly fine with being uncomfortable. And I hope that you'll learn that this is just how I am. Uh, because we can't change the, the ignorance of racism and, and the way people dislike um, by not confronting the truth of it. And sometimes that also inf involves confronting our, our loved ones, our parents, our siblings, our aunts and uncles who make derogatory comments about certain groups of people. Um, I grew up in a time when uh, blacks and Hispanics, for example, got along great and they were brothers and sisters and they worked collaboratively on the issues that related to both of them. And more and more today, you see that there's this divide between you know, say black folks and brown folks and even other groups. And it saddens me in many ways because it really reflects our ignorance and lack of understanding of how connected that we really are. And so I'm gonna confront those things directly. You're gonna see through the videos uh, that we have in class that uh, there are some things that are going to hopefully awaken you and, conf and ask you to confront your own possible bias in these issues. But also, you know, look at your friends and how often we laugh at when they make jokes about other groups of people. Do we speak up or do we sit back and let them make those jokes and, and, and we stay silent? And I would say that our silence is, is our undoing and also perpetuates their ignorance. Um, so it's a challenge to all of us. And sometimes we can't change the people who, who come before us, but we can change ourselves. And we can make sure we don't perpetuate it in our children and families going forward. And that's the key to this chapter. Um, so in that, um, I want to be able to talk about and discuss the issue of civil liberties and civil rights. 
Now, first of all, um, to understand civil liberties and the difference between the two is to understand that civil liberties basically are your constitutional rights that are guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights are the first ten amendments of the Constitution. And basically, they're the rights that, are, that protect you from the government. They're the things that say, okay, Mr. Government, these are things that you can or cannot do as a citizen in this country. Now, that sounds all well and good, but the hard truth about that is it's all a matter of interpretation. And that simply means that the one who's interpreting that view is the one who decides what that right is. So if somebody says, uh, you have the right to freedom of speech, well, you're going to see throughout the class and some of the videos you'll be watching that there's there's questions about how free your speech is and what happens when you try to speak freely. As a matter of fact, even through the protest over the last few weeks since the, the Mr. Floyd was m murdered by the Minneapolis police officer, uh, that uh, sometimes freedom of speech can be challenged, and certainly the police have their right of interpretation of that, and so and this is where the issues lie, is whose truth is whose truth. And since you as an individual citizen may not be able to stand up to it, but you see collectively when we as citizens stand up that we are formidable in terms of challenging those in authority uh, to do what innately should be done to protect us as citizens. Now, uh, so that's the context of understanding your civil liberties, uh, that yes, you do have them, but again, it's a matter of interpretation uh, and who gets to decide how free you really are in that situation, or even when we interpret things as controversial as right to bear arms. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I wish we were in class because I have a really interesting discussion on this, but I will tell you that the Founding Fathers, if they were looking in today's world, would never have put this in or would have clarified the interpretation of right to bear arms. Because back in that day, it was built to protect the country against possible British incursion or in case anybody came trying to attack them from other countries. It was not about trying to everybody have guns just for the fun of it. And uh, the fact that uh, how we've allowed it to be interpreted today, 250 years later, is sort of interesting. And that's not to say that, you know, people should not have the right to bear arms. But I do find it fascinating that even in this day and age, <laughs> um, People will say, well, you know, innately that they want to be able to have a gun, but don't they don't want any, any checks and balances on whether they have them or who has them or have to go through any process to get them. And I find that to be sort of interesting that something that can kill people, people want to be able to have as many as they have it's a, and to suggest that this imp impinges on their freedom if they don't have that right, even though pe many people lose their lives as a result of people having guns. Um, it's sort of interesting to me how we wrap freedom around the idea of, ha of owning a gun in a civilized society, which begs the question of how civil are we? How, how advanced have we become if, if we feel less safe and inclined to have weapons than we did, you know, 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Um, that's a very interesting notion. Um, it also brings the notion, the thought that we are in a society today where um, we are much, much more violent and much more potentially dangerous than we have been in days past. And again, that's more of a sociological issue that we have to be able to ask ourselves, why, why are we in this way? Um, there's a video you'll be watching called Gun Down, uh, which I think is very it's a painful video to watch. Um, and I have some direct relationship to it, and which I will share at another point, but I won't share it at the moment. But uh, when they in Newtown, Connecticut, um, they, you know, they, all those kids that were killed uh, a few years ago, um, it's terribly tragic and sad, sad event. So by not having any constraints on who can get what guns and where they get them and no checks and balances, leaves a lot of people, including our children, vulnerable uh, to crazy people. Uh, and that's unfortunate that we live in a world that people feel innately that they have to be able to utilize whatever they can. And it's interesting because when you think about the context of when you go to, you know, when you want to drive a car, you know, the things you have to do to drive a car, you've got to take driver's education, you got to get your permit, then you got to get behind the wheel and take your driver's training and things to take the test to be able to get a driver's license to be able to even begin to drive a car. And then to own a car, you know, you've got to be able to qualify for it. And then you have to get insurance and registration. So there's a huge process to owning a car. And yet something as, as important as owning a weapon that, that can kill people, people don't want to even be able to question or have any check and balance as to who owns and who has what or how they got what they, you know, if they're qualified to own or even operate a weapon. So it's interesting that we have this weird hypocrisy in this process of this, right?
Um, but anyhow, in this chapter, one of the things is we, you know, when we move from civil liberties, which is the constitutional limits on the government uh, in terms of your individual rights, uh, which again, as, as I've said, is being constantly impeded because the government can interpret law any way it wants to, and that therefore your your vision of your freedoms may be different than theirs, and typically because they have more power than we have, uh, they typically win, unless, as you see now, in the, with the protests that are going on, we stand up collectively. And if we stand collectively, like I said, we become a very formidable force to challenge the government to do what it innately should be doing. Now, civil rights is the other, in the other context, basically are the rights that are provided or guaranteed the citizens or groups in our country to, to fully participate in, the, the, in, the, in, the, in our democracy, in our, in our nation. And there are multiple amendments, as you can see here, uh, that provide and protect uh, uh, our rights as citizens in this country vis-a-vis -vis our civil rights. Um, it's interesting to note that during the movements of the 60s and 70s, people primarily saw it as like a black movement. But in truth, it's not just a black movement. Civil rights was a people's movement. But again, if I if by saying it was a black movement, it, it tried to isolate the movement from all peoples, but really civil rights is a people's movement. And even today, as we look at what's going on with Black Lives Matters, and certainly it is the catalyst for change, but it should not be just the catalyst for change, that this is a people's lives matter as well. And we have to be able to recognize in that our connectedness to that and uh, be able to sort of get uncomfortable with the fact of what we think we're, how different we think we are, when we're really much more akin than we really think we are. Uh, and then the other thing that sort of validates who we are as people and our view of the world are what we call our natural rights. And these are basically the rights that are sort of God-given, if you would. Um, uh, John Locke said famously that um, when he talked about our natural rights, that we were all entitled to life, liberty, and property, that all citizens were considered were, were to be provided that. It was just our natural given rights. Um, and these are rights that the government cannot take away from you. And they're sort of innately ingrained in us as citizens in terms of what we think we are or what we think we're allowed to have or, or should be able to protect it from. Now, um, in that, uh, the things that limit our rights um, or, you know, that challenge them, you know, when we have conflicts in terms of ideas, those are usually perpetuated by the government. Um, or when they could go in, what they what the government might, might perceive as a conflict against the collective good of society. When these conflicts uh, happen, usually they're resolved either through the court system. Sometimes they may get as high as the as Congress itself. Uh, sometimes the president will get involved, um, and then also the people. Like now, when the people are rising up, um, this is these are the ways we, we we resolve conflicts, and sometimes they're painful. Sometimes they're scary. Uh, sometimes people get hurt. But I would argue that no change comes without people putting risk or taking risk. Uh, when you look back and look at the civil rights movement, certainly it was a movement that if you if you go through and look at the people who died to, to, for it to happen and to move it forward, um, you can see there's a long list of people who made those sacrifices. And I would argue that we honor them by continuing to do make sure that we recognize that our roles should continue to move forward. Now, having said that, I will tell you that um, to me over the last three or four decades that the, move, the advancements that we made in the 1960s and 70s have been whittled away very slowly through laws and policies so that just because the civil rights movement moved the bar from step A to step B because people got sort of lazy after that and sort of apathetic about protecting the civil rights because, again, now they thought because they moved the bar forward that they didn't realize that they could be taken away from them. And so today what we see is a, is a challenge to the civil rights movement. And now in this younger generation, we see now that a lot of you are now stepping up and speaking out because you are starting to begin to realize the importance of, of the rights that are accorded to you as citizens. And that's a pretty powerful movement. So a lot of young people are out there on the streets and, and are standing up. And I think that that's actually a really great thing, um, even though it might require some pain and growth in the process. So hopefully you, you are all, by watching, will become more conscious of what's taking place because this is one of those pivot points in history that rarely do people get to go through, and you're getting a chance to see it firsthand. Okay, so when you look at the Bill of Rights,
you can see that uh, if you look across the first 10 amendments here, and this is just an example, so you can take a look at what your basic rights are. You see most of them, uh, when you get from actually uh, number four to number 10, most of them really deal with the issue of, of criminal behavior and uh, your rights as a protected citizen if you are, so if the, if the authorities are trying to come and get you, right? And uh, again, this is always subject to question when you get to court because there's process they're supposed to follow, but most people don't know their rights. And so they can allow them to be trampled on if you're not careful. Uh, so this is just an example of that. Let me cite a couple of other examples for you as well um, in this process. So, for example, uh, when you look at the, uh, you know, who, you know, who does the, who do the, who does the, does the Bill of Rights uh, limit, and it's supposed to limit the national government and Congress from incurring, and basically limiting, uh, challenging your innate freedoms as a citizen. Um, the states are supposed to have protect more protection under the Bill of Rights, and of course, it's enforced by the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, that's supposed to validate or substantiate your rights as a citizen. Um, another example they use here is the First Amendment. You know, when you talk about the issue of freedom of religion and freedom of speech and, and uh, things like that, and to be able to address the government when you have issues, um, this is certainly, you know, when you read it, you go, yes, this makes sense. However, when you talk about interpretation, it becomes uh, another issue. So, for example, they talk about freedom of religion. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, so it gives basically religions a, a very significant uh, right uh, or place in American society, which it has had from the very beginning of our, of our country. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the counterbalance or challenge of that comes from various groups of people. So, for example, the accommodationists, basically those people who want to support all religions equally, meaning that they want to accommodate any religion that, that, want, that is, you know, a viable religion uh, in the country. And then you have the separationist. Uh, those are the people who want to separate church from state, who don't believe that you should be at that. The secular world, um, which is your uh, state, should be separated from your from your sacred world, which is the church, and that you should be able to, because there are people who may not think that way. So let's say hypothetically, if you're a religious person and you were a leader in, in, in the country, that you should not be able to, or I should say you have to govern those people who don't think like you. So you have to be able to govern people who are atheists. You have to be able to govern people who are agnostic. So it really does push you um, a little bit further to be able to contend with these issues. Uh, by the way, in this particular uh, chapter, I'm, gonna, I'm sticking it all in one. Normally, as I said earlier, I would split it up, but I'm going to continue on with uh, all of this in one sitting, and then you can tell me how you like, which way you like best, okay? All right. Um, and then the lemon test uh, is basically the rule that basically determines, that allows the courts to determine uh, whether the establishment clause has been violated in terms of how they see religion or how it's been utilized uh, during the First Amendment. Um, and that's the way they kind of decide whether we, the people, or whether the government um, is right on particular issues. You know, also the question of freedom of speech, and you'll see that in some of the videos, particularly this is what democracy looks like, and some other videos that you'll see that, if it, you know, what happens when you try to speak up, and should you have the right to speak up? And that's a very complicated but also important question. You know, who gets to interpret what the freedom of the press is? You know, based on the freedom of speech, and when it's impeded, or when we see it's trying to be impeded, um, you know, we should be concerned about that. And what we do, we want to, we want to stand up for ourselves. And we want to assemble. You know, is it fair? Is it okay if we stand up before two or three or five or ten people? But if we stand for ten or fifteen thousand people, do we have the same right? And uh, what happens when the authorities start to challenge that? Just like in the, in the video you'll be watching about the Kent State shootings, um, when the students were out protesting, you know, and for the die, the question is, do they, you know, how far should the government be able to go to to, to not hold, hold up our rights as citizens? Um, and then some of the ways that, of course, this is kind of rears its ugly head is with the issue of sedition, which is basically when you speak against the government and you're trying to promote rebellion because of, you're upset with various policies the government has implemented. Um, and that's a little bit of what we see today. So if the, if the government were trying to challenge the protest, 
you know, and those who are you know, promoting rebellion against a system that they feel is unfair. Their justification could be the issue of sedition. Um, fighting words, you know, which are words to incite violence, of course, libel, which is when you defame people, you know, by saying things that either are or are not true about them. You know, it doesn't have to always be uh, factual. Uh, but that's the written def defamation of a person. Then slander is when you speak it publicly. So both are about defaming individuals, but one is based on writing, one is the other one is based on, on speech. Okay. Uh, let me just jump real quickly here, because some of these things, again, are deal with legal matters like habeas corpus, you know, uh, your right to be brought before a judge, the bill of attainder, uh, which basically allows individual groups to... Uh, how the laws are focused at those particular groups. Um, and then as ex post facto law, again, which is law that makes something illegal after you've already done it. So if you if you committed a crime and then the law itself came back afterwards and they modified the law to to accommodate your guilty your guilt <laughs> when that's what ex post fast ex post facto law is. Um, one of the things I want to share here quickly with you, which is important, is chapter of what we call the Civil War Amendments, which are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And as you can see here, uh, the 13th Amendment, of course, banned slavery in the United States. Uh, the 14th Amendment gave them citizenship and supposedly equal protection of the law. Um, and then the 15th Amendment basically gave them the right to vote, uh, regardless of race, color, or previous slave or servitude, as they call it. Uh, so they're basically saying that even if you've been a slave prior uh, to 1865, you are now free, so you have, you're protected under the 15th Amendment. And now the question is, just because these are put into law, <laughs> the question is, were they really utilized? And we find that throughout the late 18th, early 19th century, I mean, it should say the late 19th, early 20th century, that these laws are being constantly violated. And we even have pre presidents, including Rutherford B. Hayes, who basically... Uh, pulled the Union troops out of the South after they had to finally allow for blacks to have representation politically in the South. And because he was trying to become president, he made a deal with the Southern governments uh, to basically say that, hey, if you vote for me, I will pull the Union troops out and that will now eliminate the protection for the blacks in the South. And of course, immediately the rise of the KKK, all the black codes where they were putting in laws in place. Um, that were, for, that were allowing whites in the South to segregate and to also continue to, you know, basically brutalize the, set, the blacks of the South. And by the way, it wasn't just going on in the South either. It was happening also in the North as well. So this wasn't just limited to one group or one area. It was actually perpetuated throughout the, throughout the country in many ways, shapes, and forms. Uh, so just because they put a law on the books doesn't mean the federal government is doing their job in protecting it protecting those citizens, even though they were citizens. You know, there were so many lynchings and burning of, like, they used to burn black people alive. It's really frightening to think when you used to have, I used to show photos in my class of, they would have almost like carnival days, little kids with their dads and moms watching, where they would, they would lynch them and burn them alive, uh, black, black men, predominantly, but even black women, they would find them lynched and hanging on poles, and people strolling by like it was a Sunday afternoon at the beach or something. It was, you know, but and some of the students were horrified by it. But I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't mind people being horrified a little bit because you have to understand that, you know, when we deal with racism and we have to slap it in the face, first you have to confront the fact that even if you're not a person, for example, who would take that kind of action, our our inability to speak up, to stand up, uh, is allows us to be just as guilty as those people who will pull the trigger, who will like to match. We're just as guilty by virtue of being able to not stand up for those people who can't stand up for themselves. Uh, so that's where that sort of comes from. Um, and so this becomes, and then you also see there's a case uh, which I found to be very fascinating, and there's all you'll see in the, in the videos there as well, is the Korematsu case. And you know, this was the first time that a Japanese American, because during World War II, you know, one of the unfortunate realities was Franklin Roosevelt who was revered as a president, uh, decided that all the Japanese needed to be basically put into what he called protective camps, but it was really more like nothing more than a jail or prison. They were forced to sell off all their stuff, and they were forced into basically the equivalent of a concentration camp. <laughs> and so Fred Korematsu was out on the streets of Oakland, basically, during this time with his white girlfriend, and uh, he was arrested, and he tried to fight against the system that had incarcerated him. Uh, saying, I'm an American citizen, how dare you put me into this you know, camp? 
And it's ironic, you know, they didn't put the Germans into any concentration camps. They put they put the Japanese, and they lost everything. They lost all their properties, everything in California. In fact, one of them in Poston is not too far from IBC. Um, and it really, it, it, it was a fascinating case because one of the things that became very clear was that uh, there was bias. As a matter of fact, <laughs> here's an interesting note that I mean, many of you may not realize, but that the greatest fighting unit in all of World War II, whether the war in the Pacific or the war in, in, in Europe, was the Japanese fighting unit fighting in Italy during World War II. The most highly decorated, most regarded fighting unit in the entire war was the Japanese fighting unit. And ironically, during that same time, their families were incarcerated, basically, in, in, in camps. Um, so you can understand the indignation. Um, there were hundreds of thousands of Hispanics and Blacks that served during the wars, that lost their lives and gave their lives, but they would come back and be treated equally. And they were not. They were pushed back to the same ghettos and same places that they were pushed, um, that they came from. And that's... You know, that's the reality of what we have to try and make sure that we don't ever let happen again. And uh, so we have to confront our ugliness to get to our truth. Uh, my father used to tell the story to me when I was a child about when he was impressed. He was the first black president to start uh, the White High School in San Diego in the 19, early 1940s. And uh, he, he was captain of the football team. He was you know, an A student. And uh, they were going to play classical high school in football. And when the bus got there, he was not allowed to stay in the hotel with his, with his teammates. He had to go stay with a black family that lived in the ground that they had there. And so even though he was the captain of the team, uh, it did not matter. He was not allowed to stay in the hotel with his, with his, uh, with his teammates. And the next year, the football team decided to stop coming out to the high school because they felt like we're not going to have a lot of our captain. The team to be together, we're not coming to play against you anymore. So it hits directly in the places that we live, even though sometimes we may not see it directly because of the lack of diversity sometimes in the areas we come from. But it still lives there. And I would tell you this candidly that if we deny <laughs> rights to one day, they may one day be denied to us. You know, so we have to be very careful about um, who we try to deny rights to or who, or who we discriminate against. And that's the challenge that we have going forward uh, today and throughout our whole lives. Uh, to, even though people may think like differently than us, may look differently than us, that we have to be able to accept those things that we may not understand um, well for ourselves. Uh, and I hope that you will take this from this uh, For this particular chapter, and spend some time uh, going through the things that I have in here. This is really one of the most important chapters, and I'll probably, on the final, um, there'll be a big question that's related to this issue. So do some time looking at those videos, okay? All right, you guys. Um, see you in Chapter 4.